radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, welcome, Fade to Black. Today is Tuesday, October 17th, 2023. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Let's do this, man. I can hear my dryer in the background. I normally turn it off. Today was laundry day. Yeah, I was domestic. Got stuff done. I, I, I do these things. I just spaced turning it off. I can hear it. I can, I can hear it. Maybe you can't, but I can. Let's get this show started. Tonight, our guest is Daryl Anka. And I've called this show uh, tonight our meta, metaphysical world. And that allows me and, of course, Daryl to just about go into any direction that the conversation wants to go. And it's going to be great. It's always awesome when he is on with us. I want to remind everybody of a couple of things. One, help support the show. Get your Fade to Black t-shirts. The links are below. Two shirts, two ways to get them. The links are below. And uh, it includes shipping. Everything is autographed. So get your shirts. Help support the show. That's below. And also, coming up in three weeks... Stairway to the Stars at the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. Daryl will be there, and the links for that are below. Tickets are going fast. Uh, the uh, discount promo code uh, for your discounted tickets is also below in the links. So get your tickets for that. And then uh, one last quick thing. Tomorrow night, my guest is Richard Dolan. And uh, so we've got a great week. Uh, it's a short week this week uh, because I've got a TV production stuff that I've got to do starting on Thursday. And I've got to do that this week. So there won't be a show on Thursday night, taking another night off. And it will be the same thing next week too, as well. I've got uh, TV stuff that I've got to shoot over the weekend. So I will be uh, gone uh, from uh, Thursday until Sunday. Uh, but three great shows next week, that's for sure. Okay, all right, let's get straight to it. Uh, Daryl, of course, is a writer. He's a director. He's a producer. That's why I'm wearing my Steven Spielberg shirt tonight for Daryl. I, I don't need, we were talking earlier. He didn't say anything about the recognition of, of his excellence in filmmaking. He has done it all. Um, and he's got his own film company uh, with his producing partner and wife, Erica Jordan. Uh, he has worked on just about every blockbuster film in the last 30 years. We'll discuss some of that too as well tonight. And of course, uh, we'll talk a little Bashar as well. Uh, and his business partner, April uh, Rochelle, she's the CEO of Bashar Communications. And he's always doing that and working on new films and scripts and sci-fi stuff. We're going to discuss all of that tonight in our medical, me, medical, in our meta, metaphysical world. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only Daryl Anka. There he is right there. How you hey, doing, Jimmy. man? Good. How are you? Good to be back. You know, it, it's it's good. I mean, man, it's always uh, great to see and, and, and talk with you. Um, and tonight's no exception, man. It's just an honor and a privilege, my friend. Oh, thank you. I, you as well. And uh, you didn't say, dude, I'm Spielberg. I woke up today going through my closet. I'm like, Daryl's on the show. What do I do? What about, ah, let's go Spielberg. Well, you don't have a, a Close Encounter shirt? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Actually, I, I should have done that. Yeah, you're right about that. You're right about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is where uh, I, I kind of wanted to start here tonight. And... Mm -hmm. 
Uh, hopefully, it's not a question that you've been asked in the past, especially the recent past, um, but hopefully one that you've thought about. And it's this. Your, you know, going back uh, to the 70s and your close encounters, right, mm-hmm. um, and 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 your journey and your hero's journey, and then, of course, Bashar, you have uh, not, you, it, it, during uh, some Bashar sessions, you've made uh, predictions about first contact and uh, mass disclosure uh, to the world. Um, and now it seems it's happening, right? And, and you've been talking about it. And, and you know when, when you're doing your thing and I'm out there in front of you, uh, I'm in front of Bashar, I should say. <laughs> I'm looking out at the audience um, when Bashar is speaking, and they're taking notes. Mm-hmm. They are paying attention. And when you say things like that, it gets noted. And people are hopeful, right? They want this. But now it's actually happening. How how does that make you feel? Have you thought about that? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm gratified to see that the beginnings of disclosure are starting to be talked about by <clears throat> sources that probably we wouldn't have expected to be talking about these things. So it is coming more into the mainstream making it more viable for people to report sightings and not be ridiculed by it, to talk about it somewhat, you know, fully and more intelligently on news programs and things like that. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that it's starting to happen. Uh, more will be happening, I believe, but in the upcoming years, <clears throat> but uh, it's a good beginning. Do you do you feel and I hear your words, right? Because it's it's nearly tangible, right? It's like, oof, man, it's like it's like right in front of us now. Mm-hmm. Um, and and when it gets to that point, is the world truly prepared for this, or is it going to be like Kardashian news where it's going to be in and out of the news cycle in a day? Well, I think it'll take a while for everyone to get used to it. And I don't know that necessarily everyone will get used to it. But I think there are enough people on the planet who truly do want this, uh, truly are open to the idea of contact with extraterrestrial beings, that we've reached that point where we've sort of tipped the scales. There's enough people that say, you know, let's really bring this out into the open. Let's talk about this. Let's let's. Let's discuss what it is that will change on the earth when something like that happens and be prepared for it. So uh, I do think that a lot of the metaphysical um, conferences that are happening, uh, you know, what's coming up uh, in Las Vegas, the Stairway to the Stars at the Disclosure Fest, these are all things that I believe the ETs are watching so that they can know when we're step by step getting closer up that stairway. Uh, toward them. Um, And, you know, we have to remember, I think, you know, for a long time, we've been thinking about contact from our point of view. But we have to remember that the ETs have their point of view of contact as well. And the things that they're doing to help prepare us to bring us into their field, so to speak. So I'm not sure it's going to happen exactly the way we might depict in a sci-fi scenario in some of our movies because we have to take into account the way that this might happen from the ET side of things as well. So there may be some surprises about how it happens, how they reveal themselves, when they do, why they do. Um, But I think that anything we can do to be better prepared and better aware of the fact that we're not alone uh, will help us toward that end. Um, Bashar has uh, a sense of humor. Right. He does. He's a he's a he's a funny dude. Yeah. And um, and I often wonder because we take and we should we take this uh, as earthlings, the mm-hmm. subject very seriously. Mm-hmm. But I almost envision, you know, like Bashar, you know, stepping off the craft, doing a little soft shoe. I told you we'd be here. You know, <laughs> you, just, you know, and, and that it may not be as intense as we're projecting, right? That it may be a little bit different. Do do you feel that that's possible? 
It may be a lot different than we imagine. And I think that's one of the things that Bashar is going to talk about a little bit at Stairway to the Stars, is it's time for him to sort of discuss what we really need to understand about who they are and how contact may actually really begin to happen. So um, I, I think I'm excited to have him discuss what the differences may be and what we can do to bring about our understanding of those differences to bring us closer to contact. So yeah, I'm not sure it'll be like anything we expect, but we'll yeah, see. Yeah, exactly. And one mm. one last thing, we'll we'll move on. Um, we can we can talk about Bashar all night, but uh, one last thing, which is this. I remember, uh, now you're my guest. It isn't about me, but I'm just going to share this with you about me. Um, I, I'm speaking, I've got a, a big crowd in front of me, you know, a couple thousand people. And I crack a couple jokes. All mm -hmm. right. I do. I do. I crack a couple abduction jokes or whatever. And I'm walking off the stage and there were some irate people waiting for me. <laughs> and they were saying, that, you can't joke about this, man. It's not sure. for this, this. You cannot joke about. And and going back to Bashar, which the, the, the focus of uh, the audience that is there is awesome, right? I mean, they're completely laser focused on everything that is being said. And then Bashar comes off with a one liner. Mm -hmm. And everybody laughs and mm -hmm. it's like releases the tension in the room. We need that in this community, don't we? We do. I think so. Plus, I mean, he's got different reasons for presenting himself that way. First of all, to make himself relatable. <clears throat> they do have a sense of humor. It may not be exactly like ours and it may not be based on the kinds of things that we choose to be humorous about. But I think it's not only the idea of making him relatable, I think it's the idea that when people laugh, they're more open to receiving information that he has to share with them. They relax, they open up. So uh, I think it serves a number of different purposes. And, you know, it's kind of long been said that humor is one of the signs of intelligence. So I think that a very advanced being is going to be somewhat humorous and not so quite so serious about a lot of things because they're looking at the cosmos from a completely different point of view and almost like the old, you know, Buddhist, you know, point of view of, you know, it, in some ways there's kind of a cosmic joke going on. And I don't mean that to be flippant. I mean that looking at reality from their point of view, they understand that there is a lot of humor in what we're creating on this planet. I mean, Bashar has himself, you know, been asked about, well, you know, what do you find humorous about us? And one of the things that he said is like, because we can see how powerful you are as spirits, it's like watching when you're, when you're dealing with the idea of physical limitations on your planet the way that we do. It's like watching a seven foot tall person trying to stuff themselves into a one foot tall box because you're just doing everything you can to kind of limit yourselves in a certain way and you just don't realize how big you are and how powerful you are. And in some senses, one aspect of that is humorous to them because they know we're eternal, they know we're powerful, they know we're infinite, and watching someone bend over backwards trying not to be from their point of view is actually kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, we do everything we can to get in our own way. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's our job. <laughs> It's our job. And that must be, well, it, you know why it's humorous to them? Because they went through it too. It's an evolutionary in some thing. Ways. Yeah, in some ways they did. They didn't quite have the same evolutionary path, but yes, they understand it. Yeah, it, it would make a lot of sense. And uh, uh, one, one other point that uh, I kind of want to make to this is that um, when uh, just recently... Uh, and I thought of you and Bashar immediately when, when I heard this. Brian Green, right, the great physicist. We all love Brian. He's amazing. And he said last month uh, uh, in an interview, I, I was floored by this, by the way. Uh, the question was, what are you working on now? What's your current project? And right. this was his answer, Daryl. He said, well, I don't want to sound strange, okay, <laughs> but... But 
the numbers are supporting the theory that we can ask a question here and have it reach the other side of the universe and get the answer back here before we sent it. Mm-hmm. And I went, what, what did, what, what the what what did he what did he just say? And then I immediately thought of Bashar mm-hmm. and that type of communication. Yeah, because if Brian is working on this and he says the numbers say yes, right now we're going to work this out in the lab. Okay, I right. get that, but but he's talking about he's talking about channeling. He's talking about entanglement. He's talking about. Yeah. Not, not faster than light communication. No. The speed of now communication. Yeah, and entanglement to, to Bashar is not the idea of what Einstein referred to as spooky action at a distance. It's, you know, he was saying that that doesn't happen. And, and I believe Einstein was right. It doesn't. The idea of entanglement <clears throat> is a demonstration that distance is an illusion, that everything is here and now. Everything is touching everything else. Everything is entangled right here and right now. So there is no distance that information actually needs to travel, even though we create the illusion of space and time, the illusion of vast distances. Information actually is transferred um, on a different level altogether when you when you understand how reality actually works. And, and information is transferred from one pattern of energy to another pattern of energy, but all of that is happening right here, right now, in the same space, regardless of what our illusion of distance and time looks like to us in the physical reality. So yeah, and and Bashar has always said, cause and effect are, are one thing. You know, one doesn't really come before the other. We just have the experience of it that way because of linear space-time perspectives. But, and that's why he's always kind of said, when you ask a question, the answer is implicit in asking the question. You already have the information. You just have to open up to the idea that you do. Because your ability to even conceive of a question means you have to be tapping into the answer somehow, tapping into the whole concept, the the cause and the effect of the concept. So, yeah, it all happens right here and right now. We just have to adjust our frequency to be able to access the answer as easily as we conceive of the question. Yeah, and when when Bashar uh, makes these statements, and you know, I've I've heard it many times. You know, I've stood right in front of you and Bashar, and and you know, been one of those yeah. laser focused people. When when he makes those statements that. Uh, time is is we it, it, it everything is in the now now for us you know the fa- mm-hmm. uh, the the past the future and right. and and everything it's all now it's all happening at the same time that's a hard concept for us to wrap our head around because we are taught from yeah. birth the dogma of everything is linear and moves forward sure. well and it's both because the experience is linear but this the mechanism is simultaneous. So this is why Bashar is very focused often on the difference, learning the difference between the experience that we have in linear time and the underlying mechanism, which may be very different than a description of the experience. So he uses, he often uses analogies to help out with these illustrations. And like one analogy that is very simple that everyone understands in this day and age is you know, the experience of a sunset, we still call it a sunset. It looks like the sun is going down or rising. We know that that's the product of the earth turning and facing the sun or facing away from the sun in terms of whoever is located on a particular place on earth. So, but yet we still call it a sunset instead of an earth spin or something like that. So, the sunset is the description of the experience. The earth spinning is a description of the underlying mechanism that creates the illusion of the sunset. So he's saying a lot of things in our reality are that way. We have been for thousands of years thinking that 
for certain metaphysical concepts, when we describe them, we're describing the experience. And we think the description of the experience is a description of the underlying mechanism. And quite often it's not, it's exactly the opposite. It's just what we're experiencing. But the underlying mechanism may be very, very different in the same way that the earth spinning is very different than the sun actually moving and setting. So he does a lot of that and letting people understand how to look at the difference and understand the difference between a description of an experience and understanding the underlying mechanism behind it. Does it, does it, does, you know, statements like that from Brian Green and other physicists, you know, today where, um, uh, you know, the metaverse, the, the multiverse, you right. know, the quantum worlds and, and connections and qubits and, and all of these things, does it give you, um, and well, certainly Bashar, um, some vindication where we, I don't want to call us tinfoil hats. Right, but we have we have the ability to ponder and dream and wonder. Others wanted to clamp down on that and and just call us crazy. And that, but but now science is supporting everything that we have been uh, talking about and thinking about. Yeah, some of those things. And and while it's not like I'm you know looking for vindication because I understand what my experience is all about. And it doesn't matter whether anyone vindicates it. But it's a gratifying thing, I think, in general to recognize. And I know that a lot of physicists don't necessarily agree with this point of view. Personally, I think they're going to discover that this is true, that they're simply finding ways to describe scientifically and mathematically truths that people have known for thousands of years. I mean, even just going back to the very idea that a lot of you know, spiritual and metaphysical people have always said, look, everything is one thing. It's just different expressions of one thing. Well, that sounds very much like a lay version, a normal version of the unified field theory. Everything is explainable by one fundamental principle. It's all an expression of that, whatever that is. So I do think quantum physics is beginning to touch on many of the things that have been said in metaphysics for thousands of years. I look at metaphysics basically as physics without the math. I'm not saying every concept in in metaphysics is equal to quantum physics and would necessarily be defined by quantum physics. But I do see a lot of quantum physicists now approaching these barriers, these borders, where they're finding it a little bit difficult to find ways to describe things without sounding philosophical, without sounding metaphysical, because they are breaching that barrier. They are starting to realize, I think, that a lot of things that that spiritual and metaphysical people have been saying they experience is something that can ultimately be understood and quantified by science if they would simply open their perspective a little bit broader. And I think they will find ways to actually mathematically describe a lot of things and and quantify a lot of things that people have been talking about for thousands of years in spirituality and metaphysics. Yeah, I, I can see that, right? I, you know, the goal if for Einstein never got there, right? Unified, uh, you know, a, a theory of everything and right. and something very simple and elegant, like e equals M C squared, elegant, right? Mm-hmm. How it, it's, it's, few letters right a couple of numbers and and you've got it and i could see it happening Mm daryl where the numbers man they're calculated then they come up with this thing they're looking okay well i think i have it well what is it dude it's a consciousness right (laughs) i think they yeah i think they need to include consciousness into their equations i think they also need to understand that you know, the unified field theory re- relies on a kind of a reductive uh, approach, <clears throat> which means they're reducing things down to their simplest form, looking for the connections that are common between them. Well, I think they also have to reduce the concepts of space and time, which I'm not sure a lot of them are actually doing. So space-time is something that can be reduced, according to Bashar, into an understanding of space being a dimensionless point, time being a timeless moment, 
And when you have a dimensionless point and a timeless moment, that's basically another way of saying here and now, which is what everyone is saying in lay terms. But I think that the math can support the existence of dimensionless points and timeless moments. And when we start to realize that dimensionless points and timeless moments or a dimensionless point and a timeless moment does exist, then we actually start, according to Bashar, to realize that that in and of itself is proof of parallel realities. Because if there is only one dimensionless here and one timeless now, then everything that we perceive as a different place or a different moment is a perspective, a different perspective of the same one single dimensionless place and timeless moment. And it's just being extrapolated by our consciousness to look like different places, to look like or feel like different moments. And that means that those are parallel realities because there, if there is only one existing place and time here and now, then everything that we extrapolate as volume of space and expansion in time are in a sense parallel perspectives of that single dimensionless point and timeless moment. So the very existence of space-time can be looked at from that perspective as proof of parallel reality. Yeah, and 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 th- that th- that is so correct. And I'll take it even a step further for those um, atheist, non-spiritual quantum physicists out there, which is this. You've got, it, when we talk about consciousness and these ideas and parallel worlds, that's how quantum computers work. Mm-hmm. And that's it. There is no other discussion here. You are convincing us and the rest of the world that you've got a qubit that runs with a one, a zero, and both. And the right. both is connected in a parallel world to a particle that you can't see, touch, or feel, right? right? That you, that you you theoretically are telling us that it is there. Don't ask questions. The quantum computer operates that way. Well, that's exactly yeah. what more proof do you need, right? Yeah, that's how it operates. We're beginning to get into technology that actually demonstrates these kinds of things. So I think eventually, you know, it'll merge. We'll understand how one thing leads to another. It's just physics on a higher plane. That's all. Now, okay, in, in keeping this, I love this conversation. <laughs> Is consciousness of the physical or the non-physical? I don't believe it starts as, as physical. I believe that <clears throat> it's a non-physical template. It's a non-physical field, for lack of a better term. It is the quality of existence itself, self-awareness. And I think it translates into an expression of physical reality. But we have to also remember that physical reality is just a projection of consciousness. It's not a place unto itself. So I think it all starts in what we would classically call the non-physical world, the spirit world. I mean, and according to Bashar, that's our natural state. Physical reality is not an expression of our natural state. Non-physical reality is. We are expressions and patterns of energy, self-aware patterns in a consciousness field. And when we focus ourselves in a certain way, impose certain limitations upon ourselves, we experience the projection of consciousness that we call physical reality. But it's like having a dream in spirit. While we're in spirit, we're dreaming that we're not, or at least a portion of us is dreaming that we're not. Because physical reality gives us an opportunity to experience existence in a different way. Because of the imposition of the concept of space and time, we can experience process, we can experience change, we can experience discovery of new perspectives by forgetting who we are and remembering who we are through this process. So it serves a purpose. It's an experience that's unique but it's still a projection of our non-physical consciousness because as Bashar says, it's not that it's not that our consciousness exists in our bodies. It's that our bodies exists in our consciousness because these are just projections. This is just an experience we've imposed upon ourselves that seems very real, 
But when we transition back to spirit, it's like waking up and going, oh, well, that was a really realistic dream, but this is who I really am. In much the same way that when we're sleeping in physical reality and we have a very realistic dream, we wake up in the morning and go, oh, well, no matter how real that dream was, this is who I am. Well, from Bashar's perspective, it's actually just the opposite. When we go to sleep at night, we're waking up in the spirit realm. And when we wake up in the morning, we're going to sleep <laughs> in the spirit realm. So is that is that is that is that what freaks the science world out? That it is an intangible, right? That is something that they can't necessarily uh, well, measure or observe. Well, yes, for, for now. But for now, right, I don't right. think it's not measurable. I just think we haven't achieved the technological sophistication to do so yet, where our instruments are just not that sensitive. And they're not designed to do that. They're designed to reinforce the idea of things happening in physical reality. And that's fine, because it's fine to understand all the nuances of our physical experience. But again, as we just discussed, I think a lot of quantum physicists are beginning to get the inkling that there are ways to design experiments and technology that actually do start revealing this higher plane of physics, this more rarefied vibrational plane. So I do think ultimately um, we will have technology of a sort that will allow us to demonstrate the things that people have been talking about for so long that have been only relegated to the spiritual or metaphysical realm. Is it is it just because we we're not we we're, we're not at the level of understanding yet, or that we forgot what we already understood, right? Maybe well, yes, amnesia. Like said, you, yeah. Well, like I said, you you impose this amnesia on yourself because without forgetting who you are, you can't necessarily experience a new discovery. So that's basically the function of physical reality is to clean your slate and have a different experience. Because see, from Bashar's perspective, that's how creation expands. The structure of existence never changes. It is what it is. It's our relationship to it, our perspective of it, and our experience of it that constantly changes, that is constantly expanding. That's how creation expands, not the structure of it. it so does Bashar... Um... I want you to take this the wrong way, especially my audience. I want my audience to take this the wrong way. Does Bashar talk down to us? No. Does he come down to our level because of our tiny brains? Well, all he has to work with <clears throat> is the concepts that we understand, is the translations and the language that I'm programmed with. So, I mean, by definition... He's sort of limited in his ability to explain things from a higher point of view. But he that's why he comes up with so many different kinds of analogies to explain these things, because he's using what we're familiar with in our reality to sort of explain a higher concept. For example, we were talking about the idea that, you know, everything exists at once and parallel realities all coexist simultaneously. And the idea that, oh, well, you know, that's challenging for us to wrap our minds around. And yet, we have examples of that all around us all the time. He often uses the example of television programs. We know that when we're watching one program on TV, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of other programs playing simultaneously. We don't see them because we're not tuned to those channels. But if we change the channel, we are changing the frequency. And therefore, we get another program. And that doesn't mean that the program we were watching a second ago isn't still playing. So all of these programs coexist simultaneously. We only get what we're tuned to at any given moment. But we can change the channel by changing our frequency and start perceiving other things. So he's saying that's a very crude analogy, but it's an analogy we can understand, that things can exist simultaneously. So basically, he's saying, look, there's only one TV set. There's only one but there are billions of programs playing on it and you just get what you're the vibration of what you're tuned to within your consciousness. That's what you get. And some of it may coincide and agree with what other people are sort of experiencing by agreement on a higher level, but nevertheless, it's all different for everyone because we're perceiving our own vibration being reflected back in terms of what it is we're getting out of that program that we're watching. So, that's all going on at the same time. It just depends on what you're tuned to. That's what you get. 
How do you flip it? I've got two questions completely different I want to ask at the same time. Damn it, which one goes first? Okay. <laughs> ask them um, both at the same time. Come yeah. on, Carol, yeah. <laughs> well, what are you, church? A slouch? Come on, you can do it. It, it is this. Um, how do you flip it the other way where you, because there are literally infinite amounts of life out there in the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you flip the channels the other way and select somebody to speak with? Is there a galactic phone book? You know, how, how would you do well, that? Like Bashar found you, right? How do you flip well, it the other way? We made an agreement. <clears throat> to be found <laughs> by each other. <laughs> right, um, right, right. But the idea really is, again, it's all about frequency, your frequency. It's about synchronicity because you get what frequency you're on. You can't experience something you're not the frequency of. So the very idea of exploring all the things that we're talking about, opening one's mind to the possibilities of other life, that changes your frequency right there. And it sends out a kind of invitation to those operating on a similar frequency or at least capable of responding to it. And so you automatically attract what you're the vibration of. So the willingness, the very willingness to talk about these concepts, to explore these concepts, changes who you are and changes the channel of what it is you're capable of receiving. Now we've had uh, we've had real science. I, I, I say that in air quotes, by the way. I know. Uh, real science for let's say three hundred years, mm. right? I don't know how far you want to go back, but let's say Galileo or Copernicus. You know, right. let's, let's take it. That. Newton. Okay. Okay. All right. So, a very we like to think that we're smart. Okay, oh, we and uh, yeah. we we yeah we've achieved some things. It's incredible mm -hmm. to think of uh, our ability to think of the very small, the the, the quantum mm -hmm. quark world, all yes. the way to the edges of the universe. That we have the ability to think about this stuff. That's mm -hmm. pretty incredible, mm -hmm. but we still only have a three hundred year technical yeah. situation that we're dealing with if we if we are introduced to uh, uh, an advanced uh, extraterrestrial civilization that has been into science for a billion years now we we've got yeah. we've got a knowledge and an ability to understand gap right yeah. and, and and so we want these things we're asking for this knowledge could we actually understand that type of advanced mind? No, I don't think so. We would have to come from a completely different level. I mean, even, it does, the gap doesn't even have to be that big in terms of time. Bashar civilization, he has said, is roughly 3,000 years ahead of us. There are things that they experience that we just can't even at this point understand at all. And he's explained a few of them, but it leaves people scratching their heads. They don't quite know how to get there. Even though he's provided analogies and ex explanations, it's not something we even know how to get to. How, where, do, where do we even start from to get there? So, <clears throat> yes, it doesn't take really that much. I mean, just even using the example of our own civilization, I mean, how do you think an iPhone would look to somebody 300 years ago? It would look like inconceivable magic, you know? And you know, there's that famous quote from Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So you just have to be on a different level to really understand how they got to that point, how they understood how to achieve those things. But yeah, something that's, I mean, something that's a billion years ahead of us, it might not even be possible to perceive them anymore. It might not even be relatable in any way, shape or form that we can understand. Bashar has talked about some different civilizations that they've encountered, and even some of the civilizations they've encountered, being 3,000 years ahead of us, uh, some of the things they've encountered are things that, that cause them to have to really adjust the way that they look at reality in order to understand those civilizations. So, you know, it just goes on and on and on. <clears throat> And if somebody 3,000 years in advance of us is having a challenge to understand another civilization that may be even 
much farther ahead or just so different we can't relate, then, you know, there's a lot of things to learn out there. And I don't think it ever ends. The, the other side of it, I'm very interested in your opinion here, uh, is that Hollywood has... Mm -hmm. Uh, very effectively, uh, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, made E.T. Uh, 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 void of empathy, void of feelings, void of any concern of of us or family or, or our children, right? They, you know, just blasting away and, and leveling cities and, and whatnot. Um, and that's probably what is most terrifying is that you're facing somebody that you just can't go, hey, man, I've got a wife and kids at home. Can, mm -hmm. can, can you let and with no concern? But Bashar yeah. seems to be the opposite. He yeah. shows well, I, empathy. I, yes. Well, I th as, as, <laughs> yes, I think that what we're actually seeing in those movies is a reflection of us, not a reflection of an actual E.T. race. We're using that as a cathartic way of dealing with our own, <laughs> you know, emotional issues. Um, so I, I don't think that's necessarily representative of what's actually going on out there with a lot of ET civilizations. I'm not saying there can't be, you know, civilizations that might be negatively oriented, but I don't think we're really interacting with any of them. I don't think... <clears throat> any of those are really the ones that are observing us and, and looking out for us. Um, I think for the most part, you're going to find that anyone that has been able to evolve to a point where they can traverse the vast distances, I'm just going to use that linearly, between the stars, is not going to have an aggressive approach to life. They're going to understand what whole systems are all about. They're going to understand the value of everything. They're going to be connected to source in a different way. They're going to understand the abundance that exists in the universe. I mean, if you have access to worlds that cover light years in distance, you know, what's one little planet going to be to them in terms of, oh, well, I need this. Well, I'll just go over here and get it. Oh, I need that. Well, I'll just replicate it. You know, I, I, they can manifest stuff way beyond what we're capable of doing. I don't think they would have to be envious of what we have in any way, shape, or form. Or no, I, there's got to. Well, we've got Las Vegas. <laughs> oh well, okay, that's good. <laughs> we've, we've got Las Vegas. No, I've thought about that uh, quite a bit. You know, why us? Uh, why the interest here? Well, I would say, yeah, we're a beautiful blue planet. Mm -hmm. And 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 things are are pretty cool here as far as uh, the weather. <laughs> things, you know, there's there are things appealing, but mm -hmm. there's also uh, planets just like Earth without us on it that exactly. they would have to do. You know what I mean? And why not go visit there? And exactly, and, that, exactly, because you know scientists talk about the you know idea of the multiverse and the infinite number of possible planets that exist that could easily accommodate an alien civilization in terms of what they need. And like I said, if they really have the ability to go just about anywhere they want, they're not going to come here and pick a fight. It's just, it's too hard. It's what, what's the, what's the point when you can just go somewhere where you can, you know, have all the resources you need out in space in other planets or asteroids or, or, or being able to just manufacture them out of thin air, you know, I, I just it just doesn't make sense logically that they would do that if they really I, have the capabilities that we believe that they have. I remember uh, 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 it was probably about ten years ago, and I mentioned to you uh, this. I, I can't remember when or where uh, I heard it, but I listened to it uh, dozens of times after that. <clears throat> um, it was called something like Bashar on time travel. Right, and it was like this little fifteen-minute burst of a Bashar uh, discussing time travel, mm -hmm. um, something I've been very interested in. We all are, right? It's romantic, it's cool, you know, time travel, right? Everybody would like to do it, <laughs> um, and it really talk about a head scratcher, right? Where I, it was a perspective I had not heard before, mm. but now today. 
um, it, it, that Bashar and time travel is one thing. But what Bashar said at that point mm. is being discussed now in the world of physics where mm. the Big Bang may not have happened. Right. And that time is indeed forever and mm. and accessible. That 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 talk about you know science flipping over and and, oh, and yeah. going ass backwards, mm -hmm. right? It it's an incredible thing. But Bashar talked about this 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, again, there are several things that Bashar has said that, that science has caught up with. Um, <clears throat> but again, it's the perspective of someone that's evolved to the point where they've already experienced this knowledge. So, you know, whatever it is they're sharing or willing to share with us, obviously, if they're talking about these kinds of concepts, you know, we may eventually catch up to and find out for ourselves. So it's not necessarily too surprising that some of the things he said are now being verified by our own scientists when they decide to move forward in those fields the way they are. The uh, the focus, and I I love thinking about this stuff. Um, the the fight and the battle uh, against uh, ET and UFOs and and visitations of Lion's House has always been. You know, the nuts and bolts thing. How are they going to travel 50 million? Do you know how far away 50 million light years is? Mm -hmm. Well, it's 50 million years away, right? At the speed of light. How, what, you know, how, how would they? Well, it's not that kind of party today right. where that is not part of the discussion. But I'm going to ask you, how does it happen? How do you go 50 million light years <laughs> At the speed of now, you do it because it's easy, but how do they do it? There are several ways that they can do it, according to what Bashar has explained. And first of all, they don't do it by traveling within space time. There are shortcuts. There are ways around it. There are ways that avoid it entirely. Because again, <clears throat> physical reality is just one level of reality they have found ways to go through other levels of reality where the laws of physics in the way we understand them don't apply or they have different physics or they understand physics in a different way. So the way Bashar has explained it, aside from the typical answer of, oh, well, there might be wormholes and things like that that provide shortcuts that we don't know about, you know, portals and stuff like that in space that can jump you from one place to another because you're traveling in a different realm and you're not actually traveling within <clears throat> space-time. Uh, or the idea of the warp drive that I think some of our scientists are now actually beginning uh, the very early stages of developing where you're traveling with space-time, which means you're not traveling faster than light because the space-time around you has no limitation. Space-time can expand faster than light. Uh, it's about traveling within space-time where the limitations at the speed of light come about. But if you're taking space-time with you, like in a bubble, a warp bubble, then you're moving along this warp bubble or warp wave with space-time, and therefore you're not really violating any laws of physics because space-time itself is carrying you faster than light because it doesn't apply. That speed limit doesn't apply to space-time itself. However, Bashar has a very different way of explaining this idea for their civilization. And the way that they do it, <clears throat> and this takes a little bit of explanation, um, <clears throat> we look at objects as something that exists in a location in space-time. You have, a, let's say, just a ball here, and you have a ball here. This ball exists in different locations when you move it around in space and time. <clears throat> But what they see is everything is an energy pattern. And part of that energy pattern is its locational variable. So it's one of the variables in its overall energy equation. And if you change the locational variable in that object's energy pattern, you have changed its ability to exist in another space and time. So if you can isolate, that locational variable within the energy equation of an object and change it, then an object has to stop existing where it was and just automatically start existing 
according to what the new locational variable is, you have imposed upon it. So there's no traveling from one point to another at all. You're literally re-identifying where this object exists in space and time. And the reason that that works is what we said earlier. Everything is here and now. The only thing that makes it seem as if it's not are the vibrational frequencies of those different things. So as we said, going to another location, you're actually at the same location you were at, but you're experiencing a different perspective of it. They have found a way to change the perspective variable in objects, including entire ships with people in them and everything, so that they literally are relocating themselves from one spot to another instantaneously by changing the variable of the location within the energy equation of that object. <laughs> okay. All right. So you're not breaking everything down particle by particle and reassembling it no. like a, a teleportation on Star Trek, no. right? No, it, you're it, not. That, that, that's not the case at all. No, it's more of a holographic idea in the sense that right. as in a physical hologram, the image that you're seeing is actually imprinted everywhere on that hologram. And it's just a matter of how you highlight it that determines what part of it you see and how it looks like a three-dimensional object. Because all mm -hmm. the information of the face of the object, the side of the object, the back of the object, the top and bottom of the object, that's all encoded right there in that same piece of film. And it just depends on how you re-illuminate it as to what part of it you see. So as a very crude analogy, that's kind of what they're doing with space-time is they're looking at it holographically and they're saying, well, Yes, our ship and our crew appear here in the hologram, but by reorienting our perspective, our vibrational frequency of how we illuminate ourselves within the idea of the universe, we now appear to be over here. And they it's not just an appearance because the universe is holographic. So they're basically literally reorienting themselves by changing the frequency through which they are perceiving themselves, their ship, and the universe at large, it's like creating a map of all the different frequencies that would represent different locations and then isolating their ship in some sort of force field, imposing a new vibration on it and letting the ship simply go to where that location insists they must now be. Because it's not that, remember, it's, it's not that we're moving through space, it's that space is moving through us because space is an illusion, distance is an illusion. So they're re-identifying where they are in space and time. That's how they do it. And they break it down by saying every object is an energy pattern. And part of that energy pattern, part of that energy equation, one variable in it is where you are in space and time. And they've learned to change that. So when a Silicon Valley CEO of a $100 billion company, very smart person, right? says that hey man we're this is a simulation mm -hmm. <laughs> we're living in that's sort of what you're suggesting here that if yes. that's possible then then the rest of it is possible too yes but the difference is that most people think that when they say we're living in a simulation that it's coming from somewhere else bashar is saying no you're living in a simulation because you're creating the simulation with your consciousness this is your simulation. We does do that does that eliminate free will, or no, does no. that embrace free will? It embraces it because, but the idea is free will is for a particular level of experience. In other words, we have the free will as spirits to determine what we will experience in an incarnation in physical reality, <clears throat> and we could look at that as physical beings. We could look at that determination as our destiny. But we have the free will to decide how to experience it. Let's say that, you know, your your personality, you as a person, a unique person is your destiny. You can only do things as the person you are. That's your destiny. You can't do them as someone else. But how you do them as how you are is up to your free will. So if we want to consider the idea of the 
destiny that the spirit chose to experience as a hallway, and you can't do anything but walk down that hallway, okay, that's your destiny. But it was the result of a free will choice of you in spirit. So it still involves free will, but from the physical perspective, it looks like destiny because once that decision is made, then the person you are is who you are and the hallway that you, in a sense, were chosen to be is the hallway you will walk down. But how you walk down the hallway is up to your free will as a physical being. You can run, you can walk, you can fly, you can crawl, you can be happy, you can be sad, you can look in every door, you can ignore them all. That's where your free will comes in as a physical person. How are you going to experience what your spirit chose to experience in your physical reality incarnation? So it's a balance between the idea of the destiny, free will chosen from the spirit level, and the free will that is capable of being experienced by the physical personality to walk down that hallway. And a physicist would say, I knew you were going to say that, right? <laughs> that, that everything is, is, is predetermined, no matter how much you think free will no, is involved. I didn't say that. I didn't say it was predetermined. No, free no. I'm saying a physicist would say that. Well, maybe some of them would, but... What I'm saying is, yes, you will walk down that hallway, and that aspect may be predetermined, but right. how you walk down the hallway is not. You have free will to choose the way in which you want to experience what you yourself, from a higher level, have determined you will experience. Whether you're skipping, whistling. <clears throat> right? Yes, and there may be some things that are very specifically chosen, and you could say, okay, that was predetermined. But there may be some things that are allowed to be a little more loosey-goosey in the sense of, well, anything at this point will do to serve as long as it teaches me this lesson. And so you can allow the so-called random synchronicity of the physical reality to bring along any particular situation or opportunity that will serve the same purpose. And that way you could say, well, I'm not going to do that right now, but I know another opportunity will come along in a moment, and then I'll use that one. So there is some slippage there. There's some looseness to the idea. Although I also know there are some things that may be very important to the soul to have very specifically predetermined. But I think it's a mix of those kinds of things. Yeah, sure, for sure, for sure. And how much, do, okay, does Bashar talk about how much the universe is listening? Right, where you you set a goal, or uh, I don't want to use, well, I, I can use the word manifest, right? But sure, you you're manifesting all the time. Yeah, I'm doing it now. I'm manifesting a good show, right? Yes, you are. <laughs> so, the, um, uh, but how much does the universe listen, and and how do you respond to it when it is speaking to you? Does Bashar tell you how to do that? Yes. Well, this is what he basically calls the formula. It is really understanding <clears throat> what it is you're getting, how it is a reflection of what you believe to be true, how it is you respond to it that is to your advantage. The formula is essentially a five-step concept process that he says is literally a distillation of how you're already manifesting your reality, but you may be doing it unconsciously. So he's helping us bring it into our conscious awareness so that we can do it consciously to our advantage instead of just randomly to maybe our disadvantage. But the way in which <clears throat> he describes this formula in its five steps is you act on the thing that contains more attractiveness, more curiosity, more passion, more excitement before anything else. Because passion, just to use that overall overarching umbrella term, is a message from your higher mind, your non-physical higher mind that's guiding you. It's the part of your soul that is remaining, so to speak, in non-physical reality, in spirit form. And it guides you. And the way it guides you is it sends you energy messages. The energy messages are translated by our physical body as the sensation we call passion, love, creativity, excitement. So if we're willing to act on the opportunities that contain more of it than any other, that we're able to take action on, we're listening to the guidance. And therefore, 
the higher mind can send us more opportunities to act on our passion. Because it's not going to send you any more if you're not willing to act on what it's already sent you. That would be pointless. So by acting on it, by trusting that guidance, you are creating a dialogue between your physical and your higher mind. And that way, you get to experience more synchronicity in a positive way to ridiculous proportions. I mean, the synchronicity I've been experiencing lately with myself and with others who are willing to go along this understanding uh, is, is beyond ridiculous. It's just become magical. And when you take that action, number two, for as long as you can, taking it as far as you can till you can take it no further, you do that with no insistence or assumption of the outcome because you don't really know what the ideal outcome should look like, but you let synchronicity show you what you need. And whatever it is that manifests, you stay in a positive state with it no matter what. Even if it's something you manifest that you don't really prefer, objectively speaking, it's not vibrationally compatible with what you prefer, it's still there for a reason. You have to stay in a positive state to extract a benefit from why it's there. And then the fifth step is you constantly examine your belief systems and you let go of the ones that are fear-based or negative or simply not relevant for you at this point in your life. By doing those five steps, you activate all sorts of principles where it becomes an effortless path, a driving engine with energy that fuels you. Can't wait to get up in the morning and take action. It becomes a path of organizing principles of synchronicity where things fall into place in the right order. It becomes a path that supports you in different forms to allow you to continue to act on your passion. It becomes a path of relevance. Everything that's relevant for you, you will experience in perfect timing. <clears throat> It becomes a path of connection that connects you to all other expressions of your excitement in life, again, in perfect timing. And it becomes the reflective mirror that reveals to you any belief system that's out of alignment with who you are so that you can deal with it and let it go. So by following those five steps, I initially said all these things happen automatically and you go with your flow, your current in creation, because your current knows exactly where you need to go. You just have to stop resisting it. You know, it's a lot not of, complicated. It's not complicated. No, it's not. A lot of people talk about now, you know, the idea of the law of attraction. And it's not that the law of attraction is wrong, but I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about how it actually works. It's people think, okay, I have to become this frequency to attract, you know, what I need in life. No. You don't have to learn to become that frequency. You are already giving off that frequency. That's your core vibration. Your core vibration, your essential frequency of who you are as a being will attract everything you need. <clears throat> we don't need to learn to create that frequency. What we need to learn is to get out of its way, to stop imposing negative and fear-based beliefs that block it from bringing you what you need. That's a very different idea than thinking we have to learn to attract the things we need. That's automatically, that's built in. We have to stop getting in the way is what we need to do. You know what? You know what must really suck? Uh, sorry for the wrong word, <laughs> but it's the right word. Is is to to live life in a 2D existence that life is chemistry, that's it. There's, there's nothing else out there. There's that we, that this is it. This is all that there is. And they live like that. And they don't, people, they don't, yeah. the, those synchronicities that you refer to, they're slapping people upside the head all day long and, and yeah. they won't stop. They won't stop and recognize. No. And, you know, for some people that may be okay. And if they get joy out of living that way, then that's great. More power to them. Not everyone has to necessarily understand these principles, but it is something that comes with the expansion of consciousness, with opening to spirituality and our true nature. It is something that comes with evolution. So I do think that it is representative of a higher frequency of existence, uh, a higher way to live, certainly a more conscious way to live. Um, but again, you know, everyone is where they are for their own reasons. And you can't necessarily say that you know what their path is. So someone experiencing what you're calling a 2D experience, well, maybe they need to do that right now 
and maybe that will help them decide to do something else later in another life, uh, in another state of being, who knows? So it's good to share information with people to give them the option to choose different things. But as Bashar often says, whatever it is you share with someone else, whatever they do with that information, it's none of your business because you don't know their path. No, you don't know their path. But I, I, I will say this, that society, commercials, life, mm -hmm. and, and things, it is, it's constantly saying to, to the world, you must consume mm -hmm. for happiness. You must, get, you, first you're going to get a one-car garage. Mm -hmm. The goal is a two-car garage. Then after that, three-car garage. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it all, you're going to have a pool in the back and a four-car garage, and you achieve nirvana. Right? right. Okay. That's and, right. And and, yeah, and, and they 2. get there. 5, and two point five children. <laughs> yes. Yes. And 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 college debt. Right. <coughs> and, and right. So, and and you get to the end of the line, and you go, wait a minute. Yeah. I'm is not happy. Yeah. yeah. Th it's, is this it? This is supposed to be Nirvana, and yeah. they miss the train completely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I I just don't want to be that guy. Well, you're not that guy, so don't worry about it. <laughs> You know, it's 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 really funny to me. Um, where I so never did bad my humor again. <laughs> yeah, to, totally bad. Let's let's offend everybody here. Um, I, I have no shame, Daryl. Uh, but but <laughs> but I've never dipped my toe in that end of the pool. No, and I never did. I. Yeah, neither have I. But um, it's, I've always been supported. So you know, that's the thing that you learn is by experience you're always supported by the universe and it's up to you to decide how you're being supported because remember the universe in that sense just to use that term is unconditional so if you're going to heap upon yourself great limitation and great negativity well the universe is going to say okay i will support you in that because it doesn't really care it doesn't have an agenda about how it is you see yourself you get to determine that and if you want to slide down a negative path, the universe says, okay, that's your journey. Then I'm going to support you in that. And I'm going to make more negative things happen because that's the vibration you're in. That's the way it works. But you can choose something else. And if you do, it's going to support you in that as well. There's, there's no conditions about that. That's what unconditional means, you know. Uh, before we take, a, we're eight minutes past the break. So uh, one more question, then we'll take a break. Okay. Um, have you ever, uh, you mentioned earlier that you and Bashar, you know, made, had, uh, uh, came to an agreement, right? Mm -hmm. um, but have you, have you asked yourself why me? Well, yes, but the idea I think is, well, there's different ways to look at this. From a linear perspective, you could say we're the same soul in two different time periods. And therefore, one decision was made to be of assistance to Earth in this way. And therefore, both ends of that spectrum, both beings that are representative of that decision, are now functioning in two different time frames. That's one way to look at it. So when I say agreement, I don't even necessarily know that the agreement happened between two people. It might have happened within one soul that is expressing itself in two different time periods. Uh, have you ever thought that Bashar might be cheating on you? That he's made the same, <laughs> he's made the same, <coughs> the same soul connection with uh, other individuals on Earth. Well, he certainly does in other realities because right. he yeah. is multidimensional, and he could be channeling through to different realities, different versions of Earth, different civilizations, what have you. To him, it's all the same. But that's the nature of a multidimensional consciousness. I don't expect him to just be linear. So, or or, or monogamous <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. In that sense, let's take a break right here. Our guest, the one and only Daryl Anka, is with us. I'm Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. We'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023. Live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. 
as Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo with live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit DisclosureFest.org. Hi, everybody. Jimmy Church here. Very special announcement, and that is we are shipping Fade to Black t-shirts again. It's been almost two years. We did a full upgrade to the website, so you can head over to JimmyChurchRadio.com. It's all simple to do, and it's right there. Remember... We broadcast four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. We bring you the best, the brightest, the most knowledgeable and amazing guests, the best conversations. We do that four nights a week. We also do four days a week. We broadcast the news, and we do that live, too, as well. It's not a one-man show. I do it with website support. I do it with producers. I do it with writers and artists. All contribute to the show. The best way to help support what we do here is with the Fade to Black t-shirt. And you can get your Fade to Black t-shirt one of two ways. First... Go to jimmychurchradio.com, order a shirt. It's really that simple. You're going to get a tracking number, it's going to get shipped, and it's going to get autographed. The second way to get a shirt is with a Game Changer membership. Now, the Game Changer membership not only includes a free t-shirt, but you get a private email to me. You get unlimited commercial free downloads. You have full access to the website, and everything includes includes free shipping and everything is autographed. So help support the show. Get your fade to black t-shirt today. The links are below. You can just go to jimmychurchradio.com and it's right on the website. So there you go. I'm Jimmy Church, fade to black. I'm so excited that I just have one thing to say. Go back Lee Tappy. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guest, Daryl Anka. And we've been discussing uh, the first uh, uh, segment of the show tonight. Uh, it got a little technical, a little sciencey, a little Basharish, I might add. Uh, amazing conversation. But I'm going to change things up a little bit. And, uh, Daryl, I want to talk filmmaking uh, since sure. we live here in Hollywood. <laughs> um, uh, you've done every... Every, not every, I don't know. Have you run a catering business? You've done no. everything else for film. Um, no. So uh, writing, directing, uh, producing, of, of of course, editing, uh, editing. Model, model making, special Minister, effects, visual, sets, right. all, storyboards, all, props, yeah. All that, yeah, all of it. Um, do, do you have a? Do you have a? What? What? What's your bliss in in all of this? Would it be directing? Oh, absolutely. Um, I love telling stories. Uh, I love engineering effects into bring about a feeling for people to give them an experience they can't otherwise have. Now, <clears throat> right now, although there are some potential films that we're going to be getting involved with uh in upcoming in the near future hopefully um right now my wife erica and i have taken that to a different place where we now own and operate an escape room and for people that don't know what that is because it's still a relatively new form of entertainment for a lot of people it is a space a physical space that you design 
in a sense, using our set building skills to look like something else. It could be uh, a pirate ship. It could be an ancient Egyptian tomb. It could be a jail. It could be all sorts of places. But basically, people come, they book an hour, and they go through this environment looking for clues and solving puzzles to be able to get out of the environment within a certain amount of time. A lot of times in the past, escape rooms were really mostly about just escaping, getting out within the hour or so, or 90 minutes. But now it's about really going on an adventure. It's about completing a mission <clears throat> uh, or achieving a goal. And they're very good for team building. They're very good for communication. They're very good for problem solving out in the real world, the everyday world. So we're very excited now. We have one adventure and we're in the process of building our second adventure in the same location in Calabasas. Um, our escape room company is called Boggled. And anyone that's interested in participating and having a little one hour adventure in our escape room can go to bogglededescaperooms.com. Yeah, the links are below. Uh, I remember, uh, uh, you'll appreciate this. Uh, this is a couple of years ago. So I called Daryl. Daryl, what's up? Hey, Jimmy, what's up? Hey, man, you know, I want to get together this week. And you said, impossible. I said, why? I'm wearing a tool belt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm in I'm the building. middle. Of, yeah, I'm building an escape room. Oh, what? Yeah. And your excitement and your enthusiasm uh, about it. But when when you think about the the idea of putting something like that together, your your film work and and Hollywood in general is the perfect experience oh, yeah. to go and, and take it to that level, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we were looking for something other than film to use our skill sets, right. building sets, building props, telling stories. Um, and we didn't know what escape rooms were either. We were at first looking at like, you know, every year they do haunted houses around Halloween, but we wanted something that we could do all year long. <clears throat> and somebody else kind of said, well, why don't you look into escape rooms? And, and like you, we were like, well, what's that? And so we did our research. We did several escape rooms ourselves around town because there's many of them here in Los Angeles and they're all around the world. And we really just got enamored and said, this is perfect because you're kind of creating a story. You're kind of creating a movie, but your customers get to be the actors in the movie. So you kind of help guide them through by giving them hints or clues when they need them. Um, but it's a real time experience and it's very exciting. And it's also psychologically extremely interesting because it's amazing to watch all the different perspectives and all the different ways that people have of solving puzzles and solving clues and problem solving. And it just runs the gamut. And there are things that have forced us to change the experience uh, many times just because we never dreamed that somebody would solve it that way. And so we have to take them down a different path by changing the way that the puzzles work. So it's a fascinating experience and it's a fun time and people really get a lot out of it. Uh, can we talk about alienated? Sure. Okay. Here's the deal. A film like that presents itself to somebody like me, the science fiction. Right. Mm -hmm. So you draw yeah. in me and 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 men. I'm just gonna say men. You draw in men for that. But it's a it's a science fiction, it's a love story hidden inside mm -hmm. of science fiction. So right. now you've got the female side of it, right? So you've mm -hmm. got both, and I'm not saying this in a negative way or being cavalier at all. Yeah. Um, you've got a mix of both, but here's the thing, me, big macho, right? I like to think that I'm a manly man, dude, I was crying and, and I got sucked in to that movie on every level. Oh, great. What was it like to direct something like that? It must, have, it must've been so much fun. It was a blast. It was a blast working with the actors, working with the crew. I mean, I just, I usually can't imagine having more fun because you're just, you're manifesting this story out of thin air with these people who are all bringing their incredible talents to bear. You're working very collaboratively with them. 
uh, it's just a lot of fun to see something like that get realized, to get manifest. It's a real high. You should try directing. <laughs> it's a real high. Is it, is it, com is it, com is it complex to weave uh, the two? The two sure. It's two genres, right? You've got a love story and, sci -fi. and you've got this uh, and, and sci-fi mm -hmm. and, and you, you've got to blend these two in and and make it an effective story you've got to have a act one act two act three yeah and it doesn't mean that you know like every filmmaker there are probably a dozen things i would change now if i did it over again but you know you do the best you can at the time you have a particular vision at the time and you try to steer it down that path while being open to suggestions because a lot of times you can get suggestions from the cast and the crew that will actually make your film a lot better I mean, a lot of times they say that's really the the secret of directing is you surround yourself with people that know far more than you do and you let them do their job and you look like a genius because you're just letting them do what they normally do and you give them a little bit of guidance. But directing really is kind of about getting out of the way. It's organizing it to a certain point. You bring in the best talent that you you possibly can and then you basically get out of their way with you know very little very little management just to keep them on track. But that's about it. You just realize that vision and you let them add to that vision and you get a unique story. You get a new, unique experience. And yes, it requires a lot of organization, but there are people that are good at doing that. And so you get to focus just on the story, on the vision itself with the assistance of all these incredible people. The uh, the idea behind it, where if somebody would come to me and go, okay, so we're going to go check out this film. It's an alien love story. I would now. I would my how how do you pull that off? How do you fall in love with an ET? What what? How is this possible? And then uh, the world is introduced to uh, Gracie Lacey, mm -hmm. who um, uh, grabbed that role. Yeah. and ran with it she was um, the best she she you know i actually saw her picture and her resume uh at backstage an online uh casting magazine and i just knew that she was the one of the first people i saw that way and i just said that's her that's our that's our actress but then we went through the casting process and at the end of it all, she just blew everyone away. She was exactly the character. And and we wound up with her. Uh, and she's brilliant. She, we just love her. Now, as a, as a director, um, right, directors direct. They give direction. And then you have the actors that say, I, I, I don't take direction. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, we, all the famous quotes about that uh, here in Hollywood. Yeah. But but how was that working with her? Because he is uh, an extraterrestrial um, and you have to, uh, as an actor, uh, you know, move into that role. But it, it seemed sure. very natural. Like she <clears throat> I don't know, yeah. man. Uh, well, she was channeling something. You know, well, that's what actors do. They do get into right. a channeling state because anything you do that you love to do, you get in the zone, you are in a channeling state. That's gamma in the brain between 40 and 100 cycles per second. And then someone who becomes the role is channeling. That's another aspect of their greater consciousness. She just, as an actor, knows how to tap into that. And she did a marvelous, marvelous job. But you do prepare. <clears throat> you do discuss the script. You discuss the scenes. You talk about what what is the scene about? Why is this person saying this or acting this way in the scene? What are they going through? What are they feeling as a character? And you discuss all that, and and you see what the actor makes of all that, and when what they take it in and what they you know put out. Um, and again, you know, you may need little adjustments here and there if you feel it's going more emotionally one way than than another. Uh, you know, you can discuss that and, and talk about it from, well, what if it was, you know, what if you were doing it for this reason? What if you were doing it for that reason? And you get the different takes, you get the different emotions out of them until you find the one that you think works with the entire storyline. I mean, that's really what the director is paying attention to, is what is the entire arc of the story? So that as you're directing every given scene, 
you know what tone you're trying to hit that will work with all the other scenes. And you're knitting them together in your mind to see the entire product before you even edited it. And even in editing, you're creating another movie because maybe you see things that you didn't see during the shoot. So you start really that, you know, that's why you have different takes because you might want, oh, you know what? It is better if we if we make this one a little bit more angry or we make this one a little bit more sad or or a little bit more aware or something like that. You want to be able to have the resources and the number of takes necessary to have some flexibility in how you ultimately edit the story together because it's true what they say. There's like sort of three fill, three phases of making a film. There's the writing, there's the shooting of it, and there's the editing of it. And it can be three completely different films by the time you get to that point. Where did the inspiration come from uh, the, for the story? Well, just in general, just, you know, it was just a thought of, well, what if, you know, some scientists decide, you know, he finally, he finds himself falling in love with this person and does not know she's from another planet because she's here on this world sort of at taking an artistic vacation. She's an artist. She's expressing her sculptures and things like that in a, in a gallery, but nobody knows that she's from another planet. And he gets really involved with her and she gets really involved with him. And that causes a situation to happen that, you know, will resolve itself in the movie. But it was just an idea of what if, you know, what if a scientist falls in that doesn't believe in aliens, doesn't believe in UFOs, falls in love with an alien. What, what would happen if that happened? So we're just exploring I, I, an idea. I think it's fiction based on reality. I think yeah. that, <laughs> I think this is, yeah, I think I think it's a documentary hidden as a, as a creative license. Um, where? Uh, w- one last question about um, where did the hat? Who? who where? Where did the hat come from? Oh, we had that. Um, I'm trying to remember where we got that from, but it was the perfect prop for her to wear. Perfect on her head. Yeah. Um, we just, I, I forget where we got it, but it was just, it just came up and it's like, Hey, why don't we have her wear this? Because it, it sort of gives away that she's an alien without giving away that she's an alien. So we just thought it would be fun to throw that in there as one of her props. I mean, it just, it, it was, it, it just identifies her throughout the whole film. It, it, it's a, it, it's a very, na- it's like, it's hers, right? Yeah. Like, like she brought that from home or something. <laughs> I'm being serious. I mean, yeah. it, it it is just such a cool part of the movie. Everybody go and check out Alienated. Uh, I've talked about it a lot on this show. Uh, now's the opportunity to bring it up again. Go and check it out. Um, and there's one one other thing I want to mention uh, and for everybody that hasn't seen the film. When you watch it, you'll understand what I'm about to say. When you have an independent film, Daryl, you know the dilemma that you have. People watch it, and the actors, the level of production, it looks independent, it feels independent, Mm -hmm. and and that's what you get. All right? In most cases. Not with this film. Uh, the casting was correct. Uh, mm-hmm. the, 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 the acting, it just, it's all supported by a great screenplay and a great script for sure. Oh, and, and a great, and a great director, by the way, but, <laughs> but it, 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 it doesn't have that feel. It's got, it's got the world-class vibe of, of real well, yeah, actors you, doing their job. Yeah, you try to do an indie film with the, the most production value that you can. And, you know, we, we've we been in the industry long enough to know how to take certain shortcuts that don't necessarily cost as much as a major motion picture, but still allow us to get the same very high quality look to any given scene. So it's about the cameras you're using. It's about having a good cinematographer that understands lighting it, uh, and understand how to get certain kinds of sets for cheaper than you otherwise might. Um, it's, it's a big logistical thing that you have to work out, but it sort of boils down to use what you have access to. So you kind of write the story to what you have access to that you know would help your production value. So, you know, we used uh, our own home in the film 
and again, it's just the way we dressed it, the way we lit it. Uh, we used uh, other buildings that are standing sets that already exist as sets that are built for Hollywood that anyone can rent, but they're not necessarily that expensive to rent. And you can get breaks by being an indie filmmaker. They'll actually give you discounts. So it's about just knowing what you can find in the industry and writing the story to that. And that way you keep your production value up. You don't stretch yourself too far. And most importantly, you stay on budget. How, um, because Hollywood, Los Angeles in general, this is a filmmaking town. Everybody in some degree supports the film industry and, right. and television here. And everybody's a script writer. The, the cliche of waiters and waitresses that are pitching screenplays, that's not a cliche. That yeah. is, that is no. what this town is. Yeah. And everybody, everybody's a critic. Um, everybody has a love for film and television and, and they have expectations of production value. Sure. You have to be the same way. You, you set your standards high, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I want to make the best possible product I can make so that people are engaged in the story, you know? Uh, I want to back up and, and, and go to first contact, uh, if mm -hmm. I may. Sure. Um, when when the film was uh, first released, uh, you were on Fade to Black then, and and mm -hmm. and uh, I had watched it. We had talked about um, most, not most, well, I would say most, in in past interviews with you about your life's experience, and then you turn around and 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 make this film. Um, was it was it difficult to go back and and relive those moments because some of them were pretty intense. But they're also, you know, takes place here in the valley. And now you're going to just, you're going naked now, right? You're, right, because it's a documentary yeah, about my right. life. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, in some ways, the writing was probably the most challenging part in terms of what it is I wanted to dig into, what I wanted to reveal to the public about my experiences. So it, it was a, it was very vulnerable made me feel very vulnerable and open to go to those places and reveal what it is I revealed in the making of the documentary. Um, <clears throat> but I was also excited about recreating the UFO sightings I had had that led to where I am now, because it's, it's, you know, when I describe to people what I saw, the two UFOs, you know, and how close they were and how unmistakable they were and how much it changed my life to have experienced those sightings. Um, it's very difficult to give them a picture of what I saw. And so I was very excited about the opportunity to recreate with computer generated images exactly what we saw. And that way everyone knows exactly what the experience was like. So I was very excited to take people through that. And at the same time, one of the goals of making the film was to demystify the whole concept of what channeling is all about and sort of take it out of the, you know, woo-woo area and bring it into scientific study. And that's why, you know, in the film, I had my head wired to an EEG machine so we could study and see when I'm channeling, what's the difference between my normal waking state in the brain and the channeling state? And of course, as you saw, we found some very profound differences. So I wanted to demystify the idea and explain to people, look, channeling is something everyone actually does when they are doing what they love to do. When they're in that creative zone, you go into the channeling state. And then what you decide to do with that state is up to you. You can connect to different levels of your own consciousness. Apparently, you can connect to other consciousnesses as well that are sort of on a similar frequency or willing to adjust to your frequency. So there are many things that can be done with that state, but we wanted to take it out of the old new age way of looking at it and say, look, this is a natural ability that everyone has. And, you know, I think we did an okay job of, of explaining it that way. Did, was there any part of that, that, that surprised you? I, you know, well, because yeah. you're extra, you know, <laughs> well, I well mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I had but, never had, I had never been connected to an EEG machine when channeling. That's before. where I'm going. Yeah. Right. So finding out what's going on in the brain 
and how different the state of being in the brain is during a channeling state was very surprising. Um, <clears throat> so for, you know, one thing was that I thought was most interesting is there are certain areas of the brain, I don't remember what they're called, <clears throat> the, the technician that, you know, the doctor that read it all explained it very clearly. Um, but there are certain areas of the brain that process your personality. But during the channeling state, those are all turned off. So if all of the areas of my brain that process my personality as they're doing right now, who's talking if my personality is shut down? So that was very interesting. And there were other changes that are not supposed to happen, according to medical science, that happen in the brain. So I think all of the findings were actually really, really interesting. I, um, I'm just going to, you know, it... Uh, in the interest of uh, transparency, um, I have had the very unique uh, opportunity. I think we've done it four times now, uh, Daryl, where I have done uh, presentations with Daryl and Bashar. And I uh, just, you know, going to your point right now that you're making, mm -hmm. uh, Daryl and I are backstage, right? We're alone. Mm -hmm. It's just the two of us. And we're talking, everything is normal. <laughs> what is normal, right? Yeah, as but normal as we get. Yeah. As normal as we get. And and then, um, you know, the, the clock is ticking. And turn to Daryl. Mm -hmm. Literally say, okay, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Let's go, right? And mm -hmm. so I'm out on stage. I'm doing the introduction. But I, I'm, I'm with Daryl mm -hmm. minutes before this. And now I'm on stage and and bring uh, out. It, it's still Daryl, by the way. <laughs> I want to be clear. I bring Daryl out, and and I then walk down and watch the transition. Mm -hmm. And and when this happens, that's that part that you're referring to, right now, right where one thing leaves and another comes in. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Do you see it, or is it more of a feeling? No, is it yeah. a physical. It's it's more of a feeling. It's an energy shift. It's an attitude shift. It's a perspective shift. <clears throat> you start seeing things like they see them in different ways. It's literally like taking on the mantle of a completely autonomous, different personality. I'm allowing my frequency to change to match their frequency so that I become, in a sense, a model of their personality, of his personality. Um, I'm acting as a translation device, per se. Um, so, But I am experiencing it in a very different way than what the audience is experiencing, even though it, his thoughts are translating through me into language, which... I'm programmed with, which is English. Um, he's not speaking. He's just sending these thoughts. The entire, like when somebody asks a question, the entire answer is there in a split second. It just takes time for the answer to unspool and translate into English. But what I'm experiencing is this rush of energy. I'm experiencing energy patterns visually that to him is like reading a language of the person he's talking to. In other words, it's a pattern of energy that represents them and different things stand out at different times. Sometimes I'll get literal images of what he's talking about. Sometimes they'll be more symbolic. Um, it depends on what he is discussing. But the greatest difference is the surge of energy itself that's coursing through me. I sometimes liken it to the idea of I'm standing under a pounding waterfall. That's all I can pay attention to. It's overwhelming. What you're getting when he's speaking to you is the spray. It's so secondary. I don't really hear the words or I can't lock on to them. <clears throat> I know there's a conversation being had. There's an exchange going on, but it's kind of like when you're in a daydream and somebody walks in the room and they call your name three times because you're not hearing them before you understand somebody's talking to you. It's kind of like that. The conversation might as well be happening in a different room somewhere. Because what I'm sort of, if I had to pay attention to the words at all, I would stop the experience. But I'm just getting this, this feeling of what they feel like. And I'd say the greatest difference 
between what we experience as humans on a daily basis and what they experience is they don't have a shadow of a doubt about anything that they're saying. The level of conviction is intense. And that creates a profound difference in my energy and rubs off on me in a way that allows me to apply his information in my life very strongly to get the response and the result that he says would happen if you do apply it with that degree of focus. So I'm very fortunate to be able to experience how they experience life, which is very different than the way we do. But I think we're capable of getting to that point. And that's the exciting thing about sharing the information is it gives us the opportunity to rise to a higher level in the way that they experience it on a daily basis. Do you realize how quickly uh, it goes from your your frontal lobes uh, to your jaw, where you know the flow is like this? Do you do you sense that because there are no hiccups, there are no, no. you know what I mean? There are no stutters. There there are no pauses. That's it's one a constant of flow. Yeah, that's well. That's why I'm saying. See, because it's not like he has to think about what he's saying. That's why, like, when we talk, you know, there's, um, uh, um, I, right. Because when somebody asks a question, the answer is there. All of it's there. The whole thing is there. The whole concept is there. It's just automatically unspooling through my brain into language. So <clears throat> that's the time that it takes is just to translate in our language. But there's no stuttering because it's just, it's just, um, repeating it's just reading what's already there in total so that's why it's not like he's stopping to think about anything the answer is already there and it's just being spooled out it's you're slowing it down <laughs> yeah it's slowing it down for everyone to understand it and therefore that's why right. there's no um no uh no thinking about it no slippage it just comes out because it's it just comes out. there yeah. Now, what about your vision? Does your vision change? Do you see the room? Do you see me? No, my I'm standing right in front of you. Yeah, no, my eyes yeah. are closed because I'm focusing, like I said, on these energy patterns, different visions that I'm right. getting when he's talking about things. So I get to see what, you know, when he's describing his planet, I get to see it. Um, when he's describing certain concepts, I get to see it and absorb it that way. It's a telepathic link. So I'm getting the understanding, the a larger understanding of the concept that he may only be explaining a small piece of to the person that's asking the question. And therefore I get a profound education in what it is they understand the universe to be and how it works, even though it may take time for him to explain the bits and pieces to us. Um, I, I've always, it, it, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to ask the first question, right? To, to kind of warm things up. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember, uh, I don't remember the specifically the question, but I, I, I remember I was proud of it. Right. Like, <laughs> and, and later on, uh, you know, a few hours later, uh, you and I were talking, I said, I asked you, I go, so was it a good question? And you go, what was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you and have I to was, tell me what I said. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it, it's, it, it, it's not unique to me. It's, it's, it, I'm sure that many people come up to you and, and say the same thing, uh, you know, about their question. You don't remember, right? No, it's like it fades like a daydream. If somebody right. explains the question to me, I might recall, oh, that image must have gone with that question because there's a link that happens. But generally, yeah, it just when I come out of it, it's like waking up in the morning and you had a dream and then it just kind of dissipates. You're left with the essence, the essential ideas that he talked about that work for you, for me. But I don't remember the specifics of what he talked about with someone else because that's not about me. It's not about my life. It's for them. <clears throat> so it just fades like a dream unless somebody really takes the time to remind me or repeat what was said. And then I'll, I can sometimes connect back into it. But for the most part, I forget it. I mean, if I was, if I had to hold on to all of that, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with me, it would just be too much for my brain to handle. 
So yeah, it, it's too much for me, and I, I'm the one sitting there. Now, um, now, what about what about the unplugging? Tell me about that, and 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 what do you go through uh, when you when you put your I, feet back on terra firma? I yeah, I don't determine that. He determines when the timing is correct to just disconnect. And then it takes me just a minute or so to sort of reorient. I'm a little disoriented because I've been in a very different altered state. And I have to sort of, okay, I'm here. This is me. I'm back on earth. Uh, and this is what's happening. <clears throat> so it's like, it's like waking up from a very intense dream where you're just kind of like, wait a minute, give me a minute. I'm not sure, you know, where I am yet or what's happening yet. So it just takes me a minute to sort of come back to myself. Um, but yeah, it, it's just like waking up from a dream. Uh, is there a, a release of adrenaline, right? Or, um, no, not so much. The only, uh, thing that I've noticed over time is even though I feel more energized by it and more emotionally balanced by the experience, I know some energy has been expended because after a channeling, I'm often hungry and I need to refuel. And it grounds me. Yeah, come to think of it, we we do always have dinner afterwards. So <laughs> yes. yeah. I, I didn't even think about that, of course. Yeah, of course. So it, it does expend some energy that I do I do need to refuel myself afterwards for the most part, usually. But I'm also left with a different kind of energy, which is unusual. So I'm expending energy, but I'm also given energy. It's a strange balance. I wanted to. Um, uh, I was. I was recently um, in Sedona, and uh, over and over again, because I I didn't know this, so I'm going to ask you now. Mm -hmm. But I heard this repeated over and over again. Oh, well, that that's Bell. That's Bashar says that's where it's going to happen. And you know, I'm hanging out with another group of people a couple hours. Yeah, that's 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 Bell. That's uh, Bashar says that's where it's you're gonna talking go about down. Bell Rock. Yeah, Bell Rock. Um, yeah, um, it, it is above uh, Bell Rock. Right. Um, and for everybody uh, in in uh, when uh, in the middle of Sedona is and it's gorgeous. By the way, I can't put it into words how beautiful Bell Rock is, but it's it's a ginormous. Uh, Sort bell of shaped bell, rock. Yeah, bell shaped <laughs> rock. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many feet tall. It's it's huge and it dominates your uh the the it, it it dominates everywhere you are in Sedona, Bell Rock is there. It's like that. It's huge. It's right in the middle of town. Um can you uh tell everyone and tell me um what Bashar said about Bell Rock? Well, he's basically saying Bell Rock is the center of the Sedona vortex that covers a large area, but his ship is above it, <clears throat> feeding energy into it to help make it easier for us to transition and use the energy to go through transformations that we may be facing. So he's saying Bell Rock is actually the center of the Sedona vortex. Um, and that's why his ship is positioned above it, feeding energy into it. And that it's also <clears throat> being used as a barometer to let him know when we are closer or farther away from open contact. So the lower his ship is, closer to Bell Rock, the closer we are to contact. The farther away the ship is, the farther away we are from contact. So it's kind of like acting like a barometer, depending on how high or low he is above the center of the vortex to determine when the appropriate timing for contact may be. And, and when that happens, it it'll happen over Bell Rock? That I don't know. I'm sure that something will happen in the Sedona area or thereabouts, but I'm saying he's just saying that Bell Rock is the center of the vortex and therefore that's the strongest energy connection for him to interact with the energy of our planet in that area. I have, uh, like you and like so many, I've had a lot of incredible sightings, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I love it when it happens, and it's always when you least expect it, right? Okay. Yeah. But one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen was in Sedona. 
And it's very hard to explain because it was, it, dude, it was a flying saucer, a frigging <laughs> flying saucer, right? So um, I'm up on, I'm, I'm above Bell Rock at, at the airport. You know, the airport oh, is yeah. on that cliff, right? Airport Mesa. So, yeah, yeah, Airport Mesa. Looking down onto Sedona, we just pull up. And uh, I'm with Adrian uh, from Disclosure Fest, right? The two of us. And and I turn around. And I just get out of my Jeep, man. I just get out of my Jeep. And, and I'm digging into my backpack. And I stand up. My back is to Sedona. Okay? I'm uh-huh. looking at the airport runway. And coming at me. I'm not making this, this is exactly how it went. Low mm-hmm. is this, it's at night. Uh, the sun is setting, I should say. Right. It's so. a white disc just just cruising straight at us. I'm like, no, 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 no. And it's just right over the top. It's round, it's flat, uh-huh. it's white, it's glowing, and it's a disc and it's low. And it flies straight over the top of us, over Sedona, uh, mm-hmm. Over Bell Rock and then behind the trees, and it was slow, and it took about took about a minute, like yeah. a good solid sixty seconds, and it was like, yeah. no, no, I there's no way I'm going to tell this story. It, it changes never, everything, never, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. not going to repeat this. Nobody's going to believe it, but Bell it happened, it. and it happened in Sedona over Bell Rock. It's yeah. There's a lot of traffic around our planet, a lot of portals. People know how to come and go through those portals from different realities. I think we just don't see it all because we're not tuned to it. But I think people are beginning to see more because their senses, as you expand your consciousness, your senses also extend into other realms and things that were invisible before become visible. So I think we're beginning to see how much traffic around our planet there actually is. One last question before we say good night. I, 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 before I let this get away from us, uh, yeah. thank you so much for everything that you have done and, and the oh. contributions uh, to our community. And my pleasure. And it just, just, just thank you and thank you for this conversation. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask you, you about D- David Grush and his comments uh, to Congress when, um, <laughs> under oath, mm-hmm. and he said, and he says. Uh, we've got the bodies, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> we've got the craft, I've got yep. the addresses, and I can tell you where they are. Um, those kind of statements on live mm-hmm. television to elected officials, Congress, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sworn testimony, pretty heavy stuff. What, what did you make of his comments? Or his testimony, I should say. Whether or not he actually experienced that, Everything he said, I believe, is accurate because I've gotten them from other sources as well, exactly like that, especially sources that are actually even close to my family unexpectedly. So there's a lot of witnesses that talk about that. Too many for it to not be true. The story is large and complex, and I believe just about everything he said, as far as I recall, was accurate, whether or not anyone believes him. I believe that it's accurate. Do, do you expect, um, uh, I'll just say Washington, D.C. in general, without getting into specifics, yeah. but do you think that there is enough motivation now with testimony like that, and, uh, you know, of course, Fravor and, and things, mm. um, to to do something Whatever that something may be. Yeah, I think some individuals are pursuing it. Probably not the majority by far. But I think it's awakened some individuals to begin to realize, okay, we really do need to investigate this. We really do need to find out what's going on, whatever the answer may turn out to be. So I do believe some people have opened up because of that. But that's what we were saying initially. It's important that the information be talked about, be discussed, and be looked at, um, and be investigated so that we can get used to the idea that these beings are here, we're not alone, we've never been alone, ever, and it's got to be a part of our bigger worldview. We're not just this planet anymore. 
where we have reached a point in our evolution where we're global. Now, you know, we may not be doing a great job about it, but the point is, is we're starting to look beyond our planet. We're starting to understand there are a lot of other planets in the universe that could harbor life. So the very act of being willing to discuss it in those halls, <laughs> Uh, of being willing to even look at it seriously by anyone, I think is a step in the right direction. So we'll see how it progresses. But I think at some point it will probably become inevitable that we do have to move in that direction and admit that there is more to this than we've been willing to admit. We have to get over the fear. I can't. I, we're right there, man. We're right there. I think that the world is ready. I, I used to think that um, uh, it is obviously things have changed uh, a lot in the last four or five years, for sure, uh, the way yeah. that we look at this. But I think the world is, is it's, it's not, ready for a certain part of it. Yes. I yeah, do we're not going to implode. We're, no. You know what I mean? Some people may, but again, <laughs> I think there's enough people that won't that will take it seriously and will move forward with it in a positive and constructive way, that it's time to begin walking in that direction. I don't know that we're necessarily ready for all of it, and that's fine. It can be a process, but we do need to start walking in that direction. We do need to take the steps. Thank you so much, Daryl. And uh, now, everybody, Daryl, We'll be channeling Bashar uh, with all of us at Stairway to the Stars in Las Vegas, November 10th, 11th, and 12th at the Luxor Hotel. The links for it are below. Uh, come and hang out with Daryl. He's great fun. And let's all uh, experience this together in Las Vegas. Uh, Daryl, three weeks, man. Three yeah, weeks I believe for that, bread. Yeah, I believe Bashar is, is channeling just on the 11th, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you're not doing four nights and an extended stay? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Daryl, thank you so much, my friend. Thank and you, uh, I'll see you in three weeks in Las Vegas. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. This community loves you. Thank you so much. And you as well. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information with your public. You're, you're the best, Daryl. Daryl Anka, everybody. Now, the links for Daryl are below. Everything is right there. And, uh, and, and go check out his escape room in uh, Calabasas. I do want to remind everybody as I wind down here, uh, tomorrow night, Richard Dolan is with us. And uh, Thursday night, I'm taking the night off. All right? I will be... Working on the TV show. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Janicide. Keeping things together. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Richard Dolan, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.